For this episode, I've come to the northeast of England to meet one of Britain's greatest athletes, Tanny Gray Thompson, who won 11 Paralympic gold medals and the London Marathon six times. Since she's retired, she's become a big advocate of disability rights uh, in sport and society in general, and she's now a baroness as a peer in the House of Lords. She's also a massive rugby league fan. So for this week, we have to get another co-host in, and it's gonna be James Simpson, who is, of course, an ambassador for Rugby League World Cup 2021 and England wheelchair superstar. Tani, welcome to the podcast. Nice to drag you away from your parliamentary business for a, a morning at least. Um, we are counting down the days to the World Cup. From your perspective, how excited are you about seeing this global event across three competitions as well? Um, it's amazing. I mean, I think for me, the first thing is the three competitions together yeah. is a really important um, sort of mark forward on inclusivity. And we're a nation that loves watching sport. Uh, you know, people come out for big events. Uh, we've seen that with the Commonwealth Games, you know, you see it, Olympics, Park, lots of other things. So uh, I, I think, you know, sport brings people together in a really special way. Whether they know the sport or not, people like coming to, to watch. So I'm really excited about actually just introducing a whole new audience to, to the game as well. What's your rugby league background? So the reason I'm smiling, I grew up in Wales. Yeah. And the age I am, we didn't watch league. And we didn't even call it league. You, you'd say, you know, someone had gone north. You wouldn't even mention the word in our house. Now, this is a very union, <laughs> Welsh of its time kind of phrase. So I remember, um, you know, various players going north and they'd be, you know, like cut dead almost uh, out of it. And then I remember the point when actually the game professionalised and, you know, sort of people jumped. I remember my mum, who, who would never, ever even like mention the word league, watched her first league game. And she was like, it's not bad, is it? And, and I remember, it, it's just kind of really interesting because I'm 53. So, you know, there, there was this huge divide in, in the game. And then I guess, you know, sort of through my, my teens, you know, I love watching sport. And I, there is something about league that just the speed, the people, it's, it just, it's just fantastic to, to watch. So yeah, never question me on any rules or laws of most sports, apart from my own, which I'm probably okay at. But but I'm an immediate expert in everything that I watch in terms of sport. And I always think I can play it pretty well, which obviously... Well, actually, I've, I've never tried playing um, wheelchair league. That was going to yeah. be my next Not question. Yet. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah. Well, this is the man who can sh tell you all the rules I, uh, and tell you how to do it. I'd only been playing a year, so I started playing in 2013. And I went to the World Cup final. I remember seeing you there at the World Cup final. And I'd only been playing the game a little bit. And I was sat in the stands watching it, uh, watching the World Cup final. And I remember seeing you there. And I was like, oh, there's, there's Paralympians here watching this. You know, we're getting famous Paralympians down to, to watch this game. And so I, that's a moment that stands out for me as, as a wheelchair rugby league player, is watching the final and seeing you there as well. It, it was amazing. I like the speed and the, you know, contact, not contact. You know, um, I, I think, you know, th there's bits where I think sometimes people look at kind of, it's like basketball or league and, and, um, and, and, rugby at the Paralympics and kind of have a view of like disabled people, you know, playing nice, gentle sports and, you know, it's, it's controlled, but it's kind of right in there. Uh, and uh, I, I think, you know, for a lot of young people who watch it, it just completely normalizes it. So again, coming back to the, having the, the three sort of events together combined, just, it's really important because there'll be kids watching the wheelchair rugby who are not disabled yet, but may become disabled later in life. Mm who will just automatically connect back to those moments. That used to happen a lot in wheelchair basketball. Um, and, and it will change people's life. It will impact people being able to see kind of rugby at, at this kind of level. This is the first time, of course, that the wheelchair tournament has been played at the same time as the women's tournament, the men's tournament. All, all games are going to be live across the, uh, you know, the, the BBC right the way through the autumn. It's a massive showcase, this, isn't it, for the wheelchair sport, but why is it so important for people who are coming into rugby league for the first time? Why is it so important that all three are getting that platform together? Do you think? I, I think it, well, cause we've been talking about the world cup for a while and mm. I think it's quite easy to, to gloss over that. But when you actually really boil down to how special it is and how inclusive it is and how like modern it is to have everyone involved at the same level. And that comes from being on the same press tour to being mm. paid to represent your country equally across the board. That's the men's, the women's and the wheelchair. 
and all the games live on the BBC. I think it's actually quite easy to gloss over it when you actually boil down to it. It is full of quality across the board. Down to the hotels players are staying in. It's the same standard across the board. You know, the wheelchair team aren't like on a lesser standard. Even in that, it's all across the board. And I think it's absolutely spectacular. And when people really look at it like that and get into it, I think it's something that's really, truly groundbreaking. And you, you started your career as an athlete in the 80s. And it wasn't like that, was it? No, it it's kind of interesting because it's mm. sort of been sort of through ebbs and flows, really. Mm. So earlier, I think for me growing up in Wales, that we did get decent coverage and support. I mean, no financial support, but um, we weren't sort of treated as sort of an oddity. And then there's sort of been times when, you know, there's been some sort of patronising attitudes to it. But, you know, for me, a big part is having the women's game there as well. Mm. Over the years, I have done so many interviews where they've dug up some misogynistic person who go oh well women don't play the same do they and and what about if they hurt themselves and it's like well that's kind of our choice really um and so you, you're absolutely right in terms of how groundbreaking this is because it's not you know we've we've got league and then we've got women's league and then we've got even in sort of more hushed tones the wheelchair game it's just all together and and I think you know come on the back of Commonwealth Games which had some events included and it has for a long time um, I think this is a really important model going forward because I do think, you know, swimming and athletics, they can have inclusive events at Europeans, world. I don't think you can have an Olympics and Paralympics together because it's too big. Mm. But but I think there can be greater inclusivity. And if league shows the way, then, you know, I think other sports will follow because actually, yes, it's about having an amazing... It's about selling shirts and merchandising and tickets and all those other things. And And actually, I think this will prove how successful it, it can be. And to, people just want to watch sport. Yeah, yeah. And, and they don't they don't necessarily care who's, who's playing it. You know, it's just, they want to come in and see it and they want to see good sport. And, and I mean, over the years, I've watched loads of fairly average sport as well. You know, so when people go, oh, you know, the women aren't the same, you know, that sort of makes the assumption that all men's sport's brilliant. And the reality, it's not. You know, that's the thing with sport. You don't know what you get until it actually happens. I, I use the... Uh, the Lionesses is an example for people, and I'll probably get shot down for this, is I don't watch football. Mm. Like, I, I haven't watched it for years. So like I just don't watch it. But I watched the Lionesses, uh, and I really got behind them, and I watched the game, and I watched all the interviews and all the media and everything. And I kind of use that, is that I, I got behind them, not as a football fan, as a, as a competition fan support in England. And, mm. and I use that as an example to people. Like, I never watched football, but I watched that, and I loved every second of it, and I was fully invested in it. And I think... Uh, with with the World Cup, the women's team, the wheelchair teams, people who've never watched it before or might not be interested in rugby league will get behind those teams, being national teams and, and seeing yeah. the athletes and just loving what they're watching. Do you think that this should have happened sooner in, in British society, this general appreciation of all sports, not just the focus on the men's game, for example? And are you surprised it's taken this long? Uh, no, not really, to be honest. I mean, you know, the reason disability sport is organised outside of mainstream sport mm. is because of discrimination. You know, that's why we have a Paralympics. That's why we have separate sports systems. So, um, you know, you, you look at uh, women's sport, you know, marathon and cycling only happened at the Olympics in 84. Women were only allowed to do the pole vault at the Olympics in 2000, you know, mm. because doing the pole vault would stop them having children. You know, that, that was the, the thinking right That's up until mad, it was included it? at the Olympics. So like, really? So, you know, actually knowing the history is quite important to kind of realise how, how far we've moved on. But there's always more to do. And you know, I always think, you know, it's pretty hard, you know, competing against football, against some of the bigger sports, you know, again, growing up in Wales, you know, Union would get probably Clinetley, you know, playing a club game would get mentioned above Swansea who were in division one at the time top of the so it's it's like culture and it's about shifting that and and there has been a, a real shift uh so yeah there's there's always more to do but for me this is a, a a really important watershed moment for for the actually for the sport as well you know actually you know to to, to broaden out to a, a much much wider audience than probably currently watches it you mentioned the lioness as we were talking mm -hmm. recently to, to clear bowling uh, the president of the rfl about the, the success and that could be absolutely transformational for sport in general the way in which the country got behind that team is that something that I, I guess you would you would probably concur with the, the, what they've done is just it could be a game changer oh it's amazing i mean apart from all the funny little memes about you know uh, the men talking about bringing it home since 66 and the women <laughs> went out and did it we you know which is like yeah that's good but 
but girls will look at that and also women who you know maybe sort of around my age who went to a school where they didn't have the same offer of sport or it wasn't encouraged I mean I just went to a really sporty school so I had a really positive experience but girls will watch that and think do you know what maybe I can do that the same with you know the World Cup they'll 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 be they'll be looking at it thinking I can play league or and then saying, well why can't I play league you know and and that's amazing because you know actually we need a nation of people who are fit and healthy um and they don't really care what sport or physical activity they do they've just got to do something but unless you see it you, and it's the same with the wheelchair game you know it probably hasn't had as much coverage in in you know it, it's been getting better but you know actually being on on the telly is going to be amazing to bring people in to think they could do it and not just to do it because they're good at it just to do it because they're not very good at it but they but they love it and that's really important in terms of building the numbers. Yeah, I, th- I think it's the old cliche of like you can't. It is a cliche, but they, they can't be what you can't see. And and the World Cup's an opportunity for the wheelchair game to to really do that for people to see us. And I'm hoping the next stars of the game aren't even playing the game yet. I'm hoping they're just sat at home and they'll see it and be like, I want to do this. I want to do this. Whether that's competing for a club and competing for trophies and then going on to represent your country, or just to get out, get in a chair have some fun, have some exercise, meet new people. Do you know, I think I think that is going to come off the back. I really hope that's going to come off the back of the World Cup is, is, is all that. You can't be what you can't see. No, you're a bit biased here, but from your perspective, <laughs> having watched wheelchair rugby, what is it about that sport that if you're at, get, looking to get into a para sport, what is it about wheelchair rugby league that perhaps stands out for you? Um, it's the speed, it's the element of danger, <laughs> yeah. you know, some of the, you know, uh, kind of the crashes, you know, it, it is fun and it's exciting to watch. Uh, and it just pulls you in and you don't need to know like all the rules in, in terms of, you know, it's just two teams and, you know, actually going at it, each other, you know, in a pretty tough way. So I think, um, yeah. And, and the crowd make it a difference, even, you know, the, the support that the teams are going to get will mm. sort of elevate the the competition to a, another level as well. But I think it's it's kind of really funny. Sort of friends I've got who who maybe have never watched it before or aren't very sporty probably think it's you know it, it's kind of people bobbing about in their chairs and it's a very gentle game and it's kind of fun. But that's why you want you want a bit of kind of a bit of sort of jeopardy, don't you? You know, and that's that's what makes sport exciting as well. I was wondering how how how, how you've thought about the fact that this. It's going to be a sellout across most of these games. You, you know, you're perhaps you're used to playing in crowds that are slightly smaller than the ones you're about to come across during the tournament. Have you, have you considered that? <laughs> yeah, like d- domestic games, like playing for Leeds, it's friends and family, and and we're starting to get a bit more. Like like Rhinos have been absolutely brilliant with us, and we start to get a few more crowd. And we had a record crowd of like sixty people at a league game, and then for a final, I think we got to five hundred or just over five hundred, and then we're gonna like tenfold that in some games especially when we're down the copper box there's gonna be huge crowds down there and i can't wait for it i just want to I, for me as soon as the whistle goes everything just shuts down and i'm very focused on what's happening in front of me but i can't wait to wheel out there and hopefully have a huge sellout crowd especially in the copper box that iconic venue i was there in 2012 watching the wheelchair basketball so i i am like really excited about it but i know when it comes to the game i'm just going to try and focus on what i'm actually what i'm actually doing can i take you back to the start of your athletic career and not just the, the, the achievements that you, you managed to, to to get to, but also the way in which you went about your training and the support that you had, that mechanism. There seems to be a much greater um, network for para sports now than there was perhaps 30, 35 years ago. What was it like then and how much has it changed? Um, th- there's been a lot of change. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the reality of things like the seatbelt law uh, save people's lives and have stopped yeah people coming into wheelchair sport because they haven't broken their backs. So, you know, not not saying that, you know, get rid of the seatbelt law, but but that's changed the talent pool. Right. So there was some really good support. The special school system, which was atrocious for kids' education, and I sort of went to mainstream school, but um, the special school system was brilliant for disabled children being able to compete against each other all the time. Mm. And now kids are mainstreamed. It's, some bits is actually harder to get into sport now. So even though there's loads more TV coverage... And 2012 was incredible. Um, we we haven't kind of broken through on that kind of participation um, and making sure that every disabled child has the chance to be to be active. And it's the same sort of through, you know, there's big big changes through the the spinal unit system as well. That um, 
you know, it, it's so it's not it's quite difficult because it's not loads better than it used to be. It's just different. Yeah. And we, we've still got to do a lot more to make sure um, disabled people have the chance to play and be fit and healthy and then come into sport. I think sometimes there's a little bit where the Paralympics hides actually what, what is happening on, because we've got huge success. Mm. We've got to keep kind of pushing to make sure we've got that pyramid beneath. Um, and in some sports, you know, and some sort of developing sports, that pyramid is, is not there yet. So, you know, while the major games are brilliant, the, the really hard stuff is is the development and, and that con continual opportunity. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's just different from how it used to be. It's it's kind of not better or worse. I think it's easy to forget, and I, I sometimes am guilty of this as well, but, but like playing at the top level is some people don't want to do that. Some people don't want to play for their country and they don't want to trace trophies. They just want to have a community and meet other like-minded disabled people and, and use it as an opportunity to stay in shape. And I think sometimes I've been guilty of that before as well, even with my local team where I'm like, right, we're going for this trophy. And I'm like, actually, we want people playing the game as well. And I think, it, especially in a World Cup year, it can be you can get lost in chasing those trophies when after the World Cup, for me as a coach as well, the priority is more people playing. It's the people playing who don't want to chase the big trophies. They just want to have fun and maybe meet disabled people and show them yeah. how to live in maybe a different world that they haven't thought of and, and, and things like that. So that's, I think some of that I'm going to definitely be taking. Yeah. Like, I mean, we talk about the, the word legacy sometimes is reused in the wrong sense. And we've talked about the legacy, for example, that London left and the Commonwealth Games at Birmingham may leave or what happened in Glasgow 2014. Rugby League's already making an impact with this World Cup in terms of the communities that it's helping and the grassroots structure. So presumably that's going to really influence the, the wheelchair game as well and get more people into it, this tournament. And the, the eyeballs on the, on the BBC can only help and be thing. No. Yeah, the, the, like the created by grants, the World Cup's been dishing out, like clubs have been getting eight chairs, kit and equipment. And, and you, like you know yourself, in, in disability sport, the equipment is expensive. And, and new wheelchairs and things like that, there are, there are a lot of money. And the fact the World Cup is giving these to clubs to use is a huge groundbreaking thing. It breaks down a lot of barriers people have already getting into disability sport is the equipment. And when the equipment's there, the kit's there, everything's ready to go, it's going to be a huge booster to starting clubs. So in terms of the biggest obstacles, do you think, for developing wheelchair rugby league is the cost as much as anything else? Is that the biggest problem, do you think? Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely one of the, the problems. It's like when you get a ball and a bit of grass, you can go outside and play like rugby league normally and just throw a ball around but with wheelchair it's, you, you need an indoor space you need the wheelchairs um and the wheelchairs themselves are, are cheap and i think having access to the created by grants where the world cup is coming in to give teams chairs and like a good amount as well like eight chairs it's, it's enough to have four and four three on three it's enough to, to make a difference and that is a huge barrier knocked down already and and clubs are really taking advantage of it as well it's brilliant to see and some clubs are starting to have b teams now where it is just a community team where they can have a bit of fun and, and that's a huge a huge obstacle overcome. And is that something across parasports, Tani, that you have seen uh, try, people try to troubleshoot or is that still going to be a major issue for people who want to get into it? I mean, the cost of equipment. And, you know, in, in wheelchair racing, um, some chairs now are $40,000, you know. So that is just not affordable. But even like the basic entry chairs can be four or five thousand pounds, you know. So that's a lot of money spent if you don't know whether you even want to do the sport. So, you know, and what you're saying, you know, the indoor, you know, indoor space and, and, and then potentially traveling, but there are those barriers that, that still exist. So, you know, having a pool of chairs where you can turn up, you try it, you see if you like it, you know, and then if you, you do, you can come back. And that is really, really important to, to have that, um, that sort of entry in, into the sport to, in terms of figuring out what you want to do. Um, I wanted to kind of just, look back a little bit on your transition from being an athlete to being somebody who's championing inclusivity but also involved in sports administration and then obviously involved from a political side of it was that something you always wanted to do was get involved in the politics of sport and how have you found that adaption in the last 10-15 years or so yeah I mean I did a politics degree at university yeah. uh very grandly said to my head of department I'm never going into politics because that's for losers uh <laughs> yeah there you go um and then you know travel the world and you see how disabled people are treated in other jurisdictions and you, you know became more involved in athlete welfare and things like that so it was a natural transformation for me and actually the world of sport and politics are really similar 
it's about knowing the rules uh, and knowing the field play and the engagement. And it's about people. You know, in sport, you you need good people around you. You need good training partners, good coaches. In in politics, you need people who can be that kind of critical friend. So actually, there's not a huge difference in in the two careers. Um, and really, what I want is, you know, yeah, it's it's brilliant to have, you know, talented athletes competing at the highest level. Yes, I want Britain to be successful as a sporting nation, but also I want disabled people to have the chance to be not very good at sport, just to be active and and fit and healthy, because that helps get them into work and it helps loads of other things. So. Um, you know, for me, those two levels are, are really important in terms of the work that I do now. Have you been able to achieve as much as you'd like to in your role? And do you feel that there are still barriers there for people who want to get involved in para sports or sport in general that just for some reason cannot be circumnavigated? Uh, I mean, there's always more to do. I mean, for non-disabled people, you know, socioeconomic background makes a difference. Yeah. You know, uh, that's true for disabled people. You know, attitudes to women, attitudes to disabled people. There's, there's always, but I tend to think of them like as hurdles rather than barriers, you know, yeah. or the, you've got to try and find that way around. Um, and, you know, I'm very lucky. I get to work with lots of people who are very positive about trying to kind of get through those and, and make sport open. Because actually, if we want, to keep doing well on a world stage, we need to get everyone being physically active to, to work through the talent pool. So you kind of need, you know, the people at the top and then the people who are just at the base of the pyramid turning up once a week, once a month, whatever it is, having fun, you know, to be be that stepping stone. But, you know, uh, as a nation, we need to be fit and healthy. And, and physical activity is a really important part of that for every single person who lives in this country. And it's not something that we've not been preaching for years i guess as a nation but still the, the, the statistics don't lie it's not it's not we're, we're not as a nation in a really good place so i guess a, a tournament like this that showcases sport for everybody can only be a good thing is that right well yeah of course yeah. like it, i think it's going to show especially the, the way the world cup set this year with the three different like, branches it's going to be a clear indicator that there is a pathway for different groups of people like whether it's the, the, the boys who want to get involved, whether it's the girls who want to get involved, whether it's the disabled athletes who want to get involved, it's going to show across the board that we've got these three different like pathways that you can go down if you want to get involved. Not just the, the wheelchair users or the disabled players, but everyone, like girls watching the women's team, I want to play that. Watching the men's game, I want to do this. It's, it's huge across the board showing all these different avenues into sport. It's hugely you know motivational. And you talk about legacy. So, you know, we've got the Wimbledon effect. You know, people watch it, want to come. Mm. It's what the clubs do afterwards. Mm. You know, and it's having the capacity. It's having the chairs there for when people come afterwards. And it's not saying, right, you've got to be on a waiting list for six months. Because then actually people will go and find other things to do. So, you know, the, the club role in this is really, really important in terms of getting people if, in and stay in. Yeah, if, if England, if England wheelchair win the World Cup, it'll be absolutely incredible. Like for me as an athlete as well, and as a rugby fan, it'd be huge. But if there's absolutely no legacy off the back of it, and we're not getting people into the game, yeah. that's you can argue what's the point. It's I mean, a it's a failure for me. Like as yeah. from the other side, it's it's like if we, we lift that trophy, it looks amazing. Everyone's absolutely buzzing. Years of hard work, but if the knock on effect is nothing, I'm out for me. I'll be I'll be like. What's gone wrong? What yeah. What's gone wrong? What do we need to do next to to get what? This was our opportunity to to get people in chairs and get playing the game. And and, and for me, it'll be I'll be asking what what what's gone wrong somewhere. You've worked across so many different sports. What is it about rugby league? Do you think that differentiates it from the rest, and what what makes it special? Because I mean, this country naturally is obsessed with football, um, as we've seen this summer. But what what is it about league? Do you think that makes it stand out? And how do you think it can almost transcend? further i think it connects to communities mm -hmm. and there are sports that do, do that um but i think um there is something different about the sport in terms of how it can bring people in uh and i think some of it is if you look at you know some of the great players over the years how they are as individuals you know um i think for me watching sort of league and league players you th there's a more natural connection to the summer they don't some sports you, you see sort of the most successful people. They almost seem like too far away from, you know, the, the people who are on the ground and the fans and the people who are watching them. So I think that's that's the thing that, that makes a difference. Uh, and I think there is just something about, actually, when you go to games, just the crowds and the fans, you know, you kind of, for me, 
rugby is it's a really safe sport to go and watch mm. you know where other sports don't always feel like that you know they feel kind of really aggressive I mean, for me i always think it's interesting coming from an athletics background so biggest crowd i've competed in front of is 110,000. it is amazing but you've got people from all over the world who are not sitting together who you might have a couple of british people there and a couple of british people, and it's a really really Down different Sydney. Yeah, yeah, Sydney at the Olympics because yeah. we had demonstration race yeah. at the Olympics. That was amazing. Um, and so, you know, in rugby, you're either loved or hated. That's and but I think in league, it's it's not it's probably very strong dislike. I suppose you know it's a cauldron, mm. but it's there's a different kind of passion to, to watching it. And I think that's. But what we're going to have with you know the event coming out is that there'll be people coming in who might not be affiliated to to one side or the other, but will just want to watch great sport. Uh, and that that's exciting too, because if you can turn those people into fans who'll go and watch a local game, who'll go and you know connect to a, a local sort of grassroots club, that's where you've got success from. Um, and we've seen it with the Lionesses. You know how many people now have bought season tickets for women's football? You know, and it's actually it's really cheap. You know, you really cheap. You know, you're, you're not talking about you know some of the Premier Leagues where you've got to be on a waiting list forever, and it's really expensive. Yeah. You can go and watch really good sport in your local community, and it's not expensive. And with your Welsh hat on, mm. how do you think they're going to get on? They're ranked three in the wheelchair, but I mean, how do you think that Wales are going to do? Uh, do you know what? I would love to. I'm, I'm, I'm probably like most Welsh people. I just have eternal faith that they, they will go out there. They'll be the best they can. I'd love them to win. Absolutely. Um, that, that would be unbelievable. <laughs> uh, reality, yeah. But you know what? I, I, I think there is something about being Welsh that we just, we, we, we are eternally optimistic. And you know that. I hope England doesn't do too badly. But, oh, I really struggle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've got the intel on how big a threat wheels are. So yeah, they're, or, they're, uh, uh, how, they're pretty. Are you going to be nice? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, are you asking me as an England player or as a as a rugby league fan? It's I think there's different. Um, <laughs> you, um, uh, yeah, they're ranked third in the world, and they're, they're a really consistent team. They're, they're playing the Celtic Cup every year against the other like um, home nations, of bar England, and they always dominate in that. So they're definitely a strong side. They've got a lot of strong players that like Jodie, who plays for Leeds, plays for them and she's a phenomenal athlete. Um, so they've got a really strong side and I know from her they're setting the sights quite high and they're putting a lot of hours in training on weekends when they can. And, and yeah, it'll be, there'll be a, I'm not going to say anything else as a player. So yeah. <laughs> you've done your, you've got all your research done already, I'm sure. Yeah, you've, yeah, yeah. The, just finally, Tani, I wonder, whoever wins in this tournament, what, what would you think when we look maybe back on the tournament at the end of November, what is going to constitute a successful Rugby League World Cup, do you think, for the sport in general, across the three competitions? Um, it's it's really interesting, you know, the inclusivity is is really important. And traditionally, we've talked about a sport, and then we've talked about the women's sport, mm. and then we've talked about the disability side. I think actually what we're going to have is people just talking about the whole sport and, and talking about the different strands of it in a different way. It would be amazing to see clubs thriving and people play and just young people or well, actually any age you know because I think there's lots of opportunities for older people to come in as well but people just looking at league and seeing what an amazing sport it is and thinking do you know what I could have a go and that you know the, the real legacy is not just how we're talking about it a couple of weeks after it's like next year and the next five years and then you know the next big event actually what the strength and depth in, in that is. So, you know, the legacy is is a, is kind of a slow burn. What I hope in the short term is Wales, win, Wales wins. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that, 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 sorry, I'll be all right with that. I'll be okay with that. Sorry. No, no. I'm Health so sorry. But England's my second favourite team. See, as a Scot, I don't know, I have to kind of sit here and <laughs> pray it even more than perhaps you two do. do you, wanna, <laughs> you probably don't know this, but I'm half Scottish. Oh, there you go. Yeah, my dad's Scottish. So even now, one of my friends is, is the coach of the Scottish team. And I do oh. get the occasional message off him being like, are you thinking about switching sides? And I'm like, oh. well, we, oh. no, I'm no, like no. sorry, mate, I'm, a, no, I'm, I'm firmly English. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, good luck to all the home nations, of course. Um, listen, it's been absolutely fascinating to hear your thoughts. Thank you for, for joining us and keep doing the, the good work that you're doing to, to promote the sport and promote inclusivity across all sports. And of course, the tournament's going to be fabulous when it comes uh, Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank good, you. Good luck no, to Thank England. you very much. Cheers. Appreciate it. James, uh, that was a pleasure to, to speak to Tani. Um, great of you to join me as well. From your perspective as as a wheelchair rugby league um, ambassador and also as just as a para sports athlete in general, what did you make of the things that she had to say? 
Yeah, I thought it was brilliant. Yeah, I loved it. Uh, I loved hearing about her time as an athlete and then mm. how she transitioned from being an athlete into coaching and then working behind the scenes, advocating for, for, for more disability sport and all the things she's done She's done away from, away from competing. Some of the things that you probably don't see that go on behind the scenes. And I think it's interesting to hear how much more she wants to do as well. But yeah, she's, she's, uh, she's definitely doing things the right way. She, she talks about inclusivity and that vital importance that this tournament can widen people's perceptions of it in terms of sport. Do you agree with her though there's still a lot to do in that field um, regardless of how successful yeah. this tournament is? I think there always is. Yeah. I, I see it playing. Do you know, um, we need new players, new players coming into the game, uh, a, f a few and far between and I'm hoping this World Cup is the, the catalyst here where we're on TV. They're going to see the athletes, they're going to see us on adverts, they're going to see us on posters, they're going to see us out there. But I'm hoping this is the catalyst to to, to get more players in and get the future of the game of wheelchair rugby playing the sport the day after the World Cup final. That's what I want. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's exciting. You're looking forward to seeing yourself in a poster very soon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, if that's what it takes to get people playing, well, exactly. I'm happy to do it. Exactly. Yeah. And what's the, the time scale now for you? Because we're, we're closing in now on tournament time. The summer's nearly over. What's your regime like in terms of training and your schedule? Hey, have you got your, your your tournament brain on now? No, no. Well, uh, the, the, so we still we're at the business end of the, the regular season now. With, there's four games left if you go all the way to the final, and then there's going to be a month off before the tournament starts. So I've got one eye on the tournament, but at the same time, like with my club with Leeds, I've got an eye on getting the most out of we can for the rest of the year. So I'll, I'll be ready. I'll be prepared. Yeah, we hope so, and we could wish you and England. And all the home nations, of course, the best of luck. Yeah, Tanny's yeah. going to be cheering on Wales, and she was quite happy to point yeah, out. Yeah, she, she wasn't shy about that. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you for joining us this week. No and thank you for tuning in to this, uh, the latest episode of the Rugby League World Cup podcast. Of course, you can listen to the previous episodes uh, wherever you get your podcasts. And do join us again really, really soon, where we will be bringing you more build-up to this World Cup, which kicks off on October the 15th. The biggest, the best and the most inclusive Rugby League World Cup ever. <laughs>